It's easy to get frustrated when things don't happen precisely when or how we'd like them to. When our plans are thwarted or our hopes seem hopeless, we're often tempted to question God and wonder why he doesn't step in. We sometimes try to comfort each other by saying things like, God's timing is perfect. And while of course that's true, it doesn't seem helpful in the moment. We want to know that everything is going to be okay. We want to make sense of it all. It's in these times that we especially need to exercise every ounce of our faith, yet it's also in such times that we find it the hardest to do so. I'm afraid I don't have a novel answer that will make anybody feel better in such situations, but I do have hope that God will see us through, even if we struggle to see through the fog of pain, sin, and doubt that we often find ourselves in. One thing Christianity is clear about is that God transcends space and time. This means that he isn't bound to these things, but can look at them from an external perspective and so see everything from an angle that is impossible for us as finite creatures. You might say that he can step back and look at the human story and at each one of our stories like a miner might step back and examine the wall of a mine. And he can see clearly from that perspective exactly the best places to strike to reveal the gold embedded in the rock. What we might interpret as God's absence is really just him exercising his understanding. You could say that he sees the whole wall that is our earthly life and knows just the place to set his pick to uncover true riches. He will be satisfied with nothing less for us than perfection. For each one of us and for all of creation, he has selected the perfect places to strike to make manifest his ideal plan and he is constant in his will to see his plan of restoration fully realized. And we're going to discover a bit more about this plan of restoration right now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of the time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We often speak of destiny in reference to an inevitable outcome or an unstoppable progress. One might claim that William Marshall was destined to become the greatest knight of all time, or that it was destiny that pulled the Titanic to the bottom of the icy Atlantic Ocean. There's this idea that we might not have complete control over our fate. Our choices may drive us in one direction or another, but ultimately, the future will turn out the way it was supposed to, whether we like it or not. Yet there is also the second underlying presumption, namely that we can't stop progressing toward that future. It's not only true that we don't entirely control the outcome, but we also can't stop ourselves from taking each small step leading toward it. The Christian view of destiny confirms, I think, both of these ideas, but with conditions. Consider the detailed overview of the future that Paul anticipates in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 through 28. He writes, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then 
comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Paul uses assertive and unyielding language in his description. In Christ shall all be made alive, he says. Then he goes on to claim that Christ will destroy every authority and power, and that he will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Finally, he says that when all things are subjected to him, Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Paul leaves no room in his climactic vision of the future for human agency to get in the way. We have free will, but our free will isn't capable of thwarting the inevitable outcome that God has designed. God will restore order to creation. He will subject all things to himself through Christ, and he will be all in all. For Paul, these weren't far-fetched hopes or vague visions of grandeur. Rather, these were clear, unmistakable facts about a future reality that no one can avoid. God has a plan, a destiny that he has designed for creation. We can prepare for that destiny or we can dismiss it, but we cannot change it. At the same time, just as the characteristics of the future are ultimately fixed, we are also traveling unstoppably to meet them. As Paul also says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The reality of life and death highlights the human condition of relentless forward motion. Our hearts don't stop beating, our lungs don't stop breathing, our minds don't stop thinking, our bodies don't stop aging. The world around us doesn't stop changing. It's as if we're stuck in a time machine that's carrying us onward. We can't stop traveling forward in time, we can't stop the aging process, and we can't prevent what's coming. All we can do is prepare for what lies ahead. And when our bodies do at last come to rest, our minds will still carry on, forward into the country of an infinite God, where we will continue to progress in His presence forever. We are both doomed and blessed with the prospect of this inevitable outcome. If you wanted to illustrate the idea of man's date with destiny, you might compare life on earth to that initial climb of a roller coaster, which carries us toward the thrill or terror of the future. Or you might think of terrestrial life by thinking of it sort of like being born on a passenger jet that's on its way to a distant country. We can move around in the plane and get to know the other passengers, and experience all that the journey has to offer within the main cabin. But we can't stop the plane. One day the plane will land, and we will find out if we are ready for the world that we've arrived in. Perhaps the best illustration, however, is that of a game of chess. We, as humans, are rather like toddlers playing a game of chess against a world champion grandmaster. The grandmaster doesn't force us to move one piece or another, yet he is still in control of the game. We have free will, and yet, both figuratively and literally, he has us and the whole world in the palm of his hand. Ultimately, the conclusion of the game can't be avoided. God's king will be the only one standing when the game ends. Our freedom may not be violated, but his plan will not be thwarted. And what is God's plan? Scripture explains it plainly and repeatedly. It's a plan for the fullness of the time to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. A plan to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. 
a plan that will be realized when all things are subjected to him, the Son, and then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. It's a plan of restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Of course, there is a division of punishment and life that lies before us. The early Christian universalists, such as Origen and Gregory Neeson, were absolutely clear about this, and we need to be crystal clear as well. Life should be expected for the repentant, and punishment should be expected for the unrepentant. As Christ himself states, the unrighteous will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In his catechetical discourse, Gregory Neeson addresses this division head-on. In the midst of his discussion on baptism and the Eucharist, he explains that the baptized believer can expect restoration to the blessed and divine state, separated from all sorrow. And yet there is a great interval between those who have been purified and those who are in need of purification. Thus, for the unbaptized and unrepentant, it is altogether necessary for them to come to be in an appropriate state. And the furnace is appropriate for gold that has been alloyed with dross, so that the vice mingled in them being melted after long ages, its nature might be restored pure to God. So even for the early universalists, a post-mortem purification process was a reality not to be denied, which should be avoided by means of repentance unto Christ. But along with the assurance of punishment and life that we will experience in eternity, we're also given the unmistakable and unavoidable assurance that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So whether through punishment or praise, here or there, sooner or later, God will see all things united in Christ and the restoration of all things perfected in creation. This is good news, worth sharing, a hope to be proud of, and a future to give our lives for. The ultimate destiny of all things, the inevitable reality that we are progressing toward, is one of reconciliation to God in Christ Jesus. Thanks for hanging out with me as we discuss the five universal questions of worldview. In our next video in this series, we'll begin to investigate the universal elements of human experience. What does it mean to exercise our agency in relation to God's sovereignty? The second half of this series is the part I've been most excited about sharing, so I hope you'll tune in. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, or share the video if you liked it, and as always, Thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.